And so it is my pleasure to uh, introduce the last panel of this symposium. We will conclude the, uh, with exciting discussions about gene and cell uh, therapy. And uh, uh, we welcome uh, Bob Smith, um, Senior Vice President, Global Gene Therapy Business at Pfizer, who will uh, moderate this uh, panel discussion. Okay. Frederick, we're uh, the last session of a four-day meeting, so we are going to give you guys some heart palpitations here with the excitement of gene therapy and the potential role of Focus Ultrasound to improve the delivery of gene therapies. So I'm Bob Smith. Um, similar to Frieda, I've been a longtime employee of Pfizer and uh, just celebrated my 31st anniversary with the company. But the last stages of my career here have been focused on building out a novel gene therapy platform within the Pfizer rare disease business. And so I've had the pleasure of leading that group for the last seven years and very pleased to be here to share the stage with my panelists and also with Isabel who's joining us uh, via Zoom from Toronto. So why don't, I, why don't I turn it to Isabel to introduce herself first and then we'll go down the panel starting with Russell and finishing with Nick and then we'll dive in. So Isabel, please, please introduce yourself. Sounds great. Thanks so much, Bob, and thank you to all the organizers. It's a pleasure to be here virtually. Uh, background is Sunnybrook Park, so I am at Sunnybrook in Toronto. I'm a neurobiologist, mainly working on neurotransmission, regeneration, and neurodegeneration, and how to um, solve the problem of neurodegeneration for Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson, ALS, and stroke mainly. My interest really has been in, uh, in lately in gene delivery, cell delivery as well, and large uh, molecules. And I've been doing gene therapy for the last 20 years and with Focus Ultrasound and AEV for about 15 years right now. So it's really exciting to be here and I'm looking forward to discuss with the panelists and the audience as well. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, Isabel. Russell. Thank you. Um, so my name is Russell Cruz. I am an associate professor at Children's National Hospital and George Washington University. I work on cell-based immunotherapies um, for cancer um, and, and opportunistic infections uh, as well, specifically HIV. Um, I'm very new to the you know, focused ultrasound um, community, so I'm happy to learn and share what you know, place where we could all interact. Thanks, Russell. Natasha. Hi, everyone. My name is Natasha Shabani. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of biomedical engineering at the University of Virginia and research director of the Focus Ultrasound Cancer Immunotherapy Center at UVA. Um, I, uh, our lab mainly works on applications of focused ultrasound in the context of immunotherapy, and so we're very interested in uh, what the future holds for the nexus of focused ultrasound and engineered uh, cells, among other types of gene therapy that can potentiate immunotherapy approaches going forward. Thanks, Natasha. Hung? Uh, my name is Hong uh, Chen from Washington University in St. Louis, and we bump into gene therapy uh, is because we are interested in developing a technique called sonogenetics, basically the ultrasound version of optogenetics, which we, we, would, we want to use ultrasound to remotely deliver AAV to express ultrasound sensitive switches in cells in the brain and then use ultrasound to activate the, those bio switch. So that's how we get into the field. And uh, we, we still have a lot to learn and then I'm <laughs> looking forward to this discussion. Well, certainly an exciting area, Hung, and we're, we're very interested to learn more about the work that you and your team are doing. So why don't we have Nick share his background? Sure, my name is Nick Todd. I'm an assistant professor at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, and I'm a physicist working in the focused ultrasound lab and we have a number of uh, preclinical and clinical projects, and in this area, we're mostly using BBB disruption to deliver gene therapies to the brain uh, for a number of different disease and therapy combinations. Uh, and probably our, our biggest project is around AAV delivery for Huntington's disease. Great, thanks, Nick. What I'll, what I'll do next is just share a little bit about um, what is gene therapy, and I'll just start with 
why is it really important? And one of the direct applications of gene therapy is in the field of rare diseases. So to give you a perspective, even though rare diseases are individually on a rare disease by rare disease basis, they're uncommon. Collectively, they're quite common. Worldwide, there's over 400 million people who are affected by a rare disease and roughly one in 10 individuals. So you can think of it as collectively they're common, individually they're rare. But some rare diseases are more common than others. And if we get a chance, we'll talk a little bit about how the application of gene therapy to ultra rare diseases could be quite transformational, both from a scientific and clinical perspective, but also to revolutionize some of the regulatory frameworks that we currently operate in. And just to give you a sense, um, you know, everyone with a rare disease is someone collectively like us. Moms, dads, uncles, nieces, nephews, kids, grandparents. It's a very heterogeneous impact and affects people of all ages, all, all, all ethnicities, gender, geographic location, and actually it's, it's quite profound that some of the most common rare diseases disproportionately affect some of the most underserved patient populations across the globe. And just building off of Frida's prior comments, when she and I worked together at Pfizer, one of the big initiatives we had was how do we treat these underserved patient populations? And one of them is through the application of technologies. And rare diseases, even though they're quite common, unfortunately, are treatments are woefully inadequate. There's only 5% of the 7,000 rare diseases even have an approved therapeutic. And for many of the ones that are even approved, they're very suboptimal. There are some that are dramatically beneficial to patients, but many of them are not. And interestingly, most rare diseases have a genetic origin, which is why the field of gene therapy has initially focused on both rare diseases and also oncology, because of this genetic etiology. So, that's why we're excited about the potential, but really what is a genetic disorder or genetic disease? Well, there's roughly 23,500 genes in the human body across 23 chromosomes. There's a lot of DNA there that has both inherited disorders and alterations, but also just sporadic, based upon your environment, your age, your diet, the way that you live your life in terms of lifestyle. So. We don't understand all the etiology of what triggers a rare disease and a genetic disorder, but we do know that gene therapy approaches and more broadly genetic medicine approaches can have a profound impact. And many of the rare diseases that I talked about, roughly of those roughly 7,000, more than 50% of them predominantly impact on children, infants, young children with significant morbidity and early uh, mortality. So the healthcare system cost of treating rare diseases is disproportionately higher than the number of patients that are impacted by it. Oops, I went the wrong way, sorry. So what is gene therapy? Fundamentally, what we try to do with a gene therapy approach, and this is the concept of gene transfer, and I'll share a little bit more in the next few slides, but what we're trying to do is replace an altered gene with a correct physiologically normal functioning copy of that gene. And how do we most often do this is by encapsulating a correct copy of the gene into a viral vector or a lipid nanoparticle, and then that's administered with the goal that if it treats the right tissue at the right dose, it, with the right subtypes, that that genetic material will be transcribed into a messenger RNA and then translated into a protein, and that protein will function normally within a patient's body. The beauty of some of these approaches is it could be a potential one-time treatment. So it's not a chronic care situation. You can treat patients once, have their cellular machinery basically turn that gene into a medicine, and that patient could be treated one time for the rest of their life with potentially transformational clinical profiles because you're treating the direct genetic cause of a disease and correcting it. So just give you a little bit of a sense of how we think about genetic medicines. Gene therapy, gene transfer could either be in vivo, so direct delivery to a patient either systemically or into a direct organ like the brain or the heart or the eye. There's also gene editing approaches, which is kind of the next evolution of, of gene therapy generally, is a way that you can permanently modify or delete or add a functioning gene within the genome. And then also gene regulation approaches, and you'll hear a little bit more from Hong on how you can use 
sonogenetics that will actually alter the regulation of a gene to turn them on, turn them off in a way that could be therapeutically beneficial. So just to give you a little bit of a cartoon schematic, so in vivo approaches I described, they can be systemically administered. Here's just a little bit of a cartoon that shows a gene of interest that's encapsulated in a viral particle. They can be delivered systemically or through direct injection to a target organ. The other most common form is ex vivo approaches where cells are harvested from a patient. They are transduced outside of the body in a laboratory culture setting. Those modified cells are then purified, expanded, and then reinfused into a patient where they engraft and then have their therapeutic benefit. So that's just a little bit of, I would call it gene therapy ABCs or gene therapy 101 for those who aren't familiar, for those who are, sorry if it was uh, a little bit of a repetition. And Russell, I'll turn it to you. Thank you, Bob. So I'm going to give like a quick introduction to um, cell-based uh, immunotherapies. Um, just to note, and I, I apologize, I forgot to add this here. I do have a uh, CUI disclosure. I am a co-founder of uh, Mono Therapeutics, which is a you know cell-based therapy company. Um, but we're not going to talk about any of those um, here. Um, I'm you know another disclosure is obviously I, I I am introducing this topic not because I'm you know like the expert here like my pa my co-panelists here are all you know better experts than I am it's just that I said yes to Fred and I'm eager to be part of this community and so here we are so I highlight here the schematic for how we introduce cell-based therapies and how do we make them and the things I wanted to point out is you know like it starts with you know the cell source which could be either from the patient uh, itself um, you know uh, up, up there and, and or from you know like other sources right like alginic sources so not from the patient right so it, this could be anywhere from like you know bone marrow from uh, cord blood and from peripheral blood from other donors too um, regardless of where that source is, you know, it's processed um, ex vivo, and some of that, those processes are what um, uh, Bob highlighted uh, earlier, right? Like with the uh, gene modification of cells, for example, with different vectors. And in fact, you know, like I think the FDA does, qual uh, you know, uh, classify cell therapies and gene therapies in the same, you know, like uh, uh, regulatory framework. Um, so you expand these cells and then you reinfuse them back to the patients, right? So a lot of the cell therapies, including CAR therapies, do include um, you know, uh, preconditioning regimens and some would include you know, additional therapies. Uh, next slide. So I want to highlight here the two main immune effector cells that, that you know, uh, us and many other groups are using uh, clinically um, in uh, cell-based therapies, the T cell and the NK cell. In many ways, they act similarly. You know, they, they kill something that they don't like, and in many ways, they act in opposite ways, right? So the T cell is a very specific, um, uh, you know, immune effector. You know, one thing I tell uh, my students, you, you think of the T cell as the spy. You give the spy a target to assassinate, so it's going to assassinate that one specific target. And then NK cell, on the other hand, it's ready to go, right? Like think of the NK cell as the customs agent, like the, the border patrol agent, right? Like so you either, um, you know, go in and you're fine if you have the, you know, your, your passport, your papers, and I guess you just don't get in. You, you die if you don't, right? So it's like the presence or absence <laughs> of self. Uh, so I guess, sorry, not exactly the, you know, maybe like in, in ancient caveman times. Um, so, so the T cell, right, like naturally, it, it recognizes targets on the inside, and the NK cell, you know, again, naturally recognizes sort of the inside too, but because of stress that manifests outside. So I guess that's a way that, that they can provide a window into what cells to target or not. Um, in theory, right, like we hope that they're able to actively migrate to the site of disease, proliferate, you know, and then again, like they can be genetically modified to give whatever function a redirected specificity that you want, and the hope is, you know, they can confer lifelong protection. Some of our earlier studies from um, my mentors at Baylor College of Medicine, they tracked down these patients who received these um, uh, EBV-specific T cells 15 years after the infusion. The patient remains uh, tumor-free, you know, EBV lymphoma-free, and those cells are still there and, uh, you know, like uh, visible in the circulating uh, blood. Uh, yeah, next slide. So I want to highlight this, and, and I won't go into this into too much detail, but just to 
emphasize, right, like because a lot of people are more familiar with the molecular immune-based therapies, right? So everything that's not a cell, I'm classifying as molecular. And in general, these therapies are more active, right, than the, the more passive um, cellular immunotherapies, right? And we'll go into it a little more um, in the next slide, but think of the, you know, like the active therapies, you know, like vaccines, like these checkpoints, they serve to activate something, jumpstart something in the immune system of the uh, patient, whereas, you know, like the cellular therapies that we give are the ones providing those activities, right? So an important thing to note for a lot of these checkpoints and, you know, molecular therapies, the patient obviously needs to have something that can be activated. Uh, and then uh, last slide. So I wanted to um, uh, bring this slide. This is from uh, BioRender, which is a really excellent, I don't know if there are any students listening, but you, know, you could convince your PIs to buy that program and your you know, presentations will have these really cool graphics. But the, you know, I wanted to emphasize here the difference between you know, like how we think of cellular immunotherapy uh, gene uh, uh, between gene therapy and stem cell therapy. So gene therapy and stem cell therapy, the actual product uh, isn't, you know, like the, the effects of that product um, need to manifest in the patient, right? So the gene therapy product itself, like the vector, right? Like when you give it to the patient, it's not like you're following that gene per se, but that gene's activity, right? So, and you can't, you can only test that gene's activity, you know, roughly in that patient once you've given it. The same with stem cells, right? Like they need to differentiate um, in vivo and, you know, do their function, you know, go to wherever they go, right? Like for the cell immunotherapy, in many ways, it's, it's the simplest of the three because, you know, like you're expecting something more straightforward, right? Like, you know, in vitro, you want it to kill the tumor, right? Like this kind of tumor. In vivo, you wanted to kill exactly this kind of tumor, right? So, so you could sort of replicate what you want. And, and I think that may be a good um, a reason why it could integrate with a lot of these uh, modalities like um, focused ultrasound. So that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Russell. So with that as kind of a framing for the landscape of genetic medicine, both traditional, I call it classic gene therapy, as well as gene engineered cell therapies and cell therapies, they all have one significant common challenge, which is delivery to the right tissue, to the right cells within that tissue that are gonna have a therapeutic benefit. And one of the key drivers of that, and where I think focused ultrasound has huge potential, is in these different routes of administration for target tissues. So, Nick, you and I had a chance to interact about, you know, maybe you could just give uh, a little bit of an overview of the different routes of administration and how they have certain limitations and challenges, and then we'll really dive into the substance of why we're here, is, which is how can focused ultrasound really accelerate the advancement of these therapeutics to benefit many, many patients? So, Nick. Sure. Um, so, you know, peripheral organs are a little bit easier to access and, and can also be targeted intravenously or have easier routes for direct injection, but to get into the CNS, as we know, is a little bit more tricky. Um, but for purposes of our field, it's important to know that clinical trials are ongoing with a number of different routes of administration of administering gene therapies to get into the brain and so to kind of understand where FUS might be able to help. So trials are being done with just intravenous injection. Uh, I believe Zol Zolgemsa, the one approved uh, gene therapy for a CNS disorder, SMA, is being given intravenously. Um, it's sort of the least invasive and if you go up a next step to a little bit more invasive methods that access CSF space, either intrathecal injection uh, or intraventricular injection uh, are also being done. Uh, and then finally, the most invasive would be a direct injection right into the brain to your targeted area, for example, directly into the putamen or some other structure you're interested in. And I would say, roughly speaking, the general trade-off is coverage versus concentration. So in the less invasive methods, like intravenous, you can potentially get widespread coverage, but the big challenge has been achieving high enough concentration. On the other end, if you go to direct injection, you get very high concentration, but just in that one targeted area, and those procedures are difficult to repeat, and, and so you're limited in how much you can target. 
and the CFS spaces ones are, are, are somewhere in between where you, you get a little of each. But I've, what I've heard at least is that those, um, that particular route of administration is having a difficult time reaching some of the deep brain structures um, that often manifest in neurodegenerative disorders. Um, so there's still this need for um, a solution to this problem of ideally achieving both the widespread coverage and the, the good high concentration that maybe ultrasound could help in. Great, thanks, Nick. Um, I also want to add. Sure, please. I, there is another rod that is intranasal. <laughs> so, so I do believe, so we, we have a recent paper that we just uh, published, my, my post also presented earlier today, where we show we can deliver uh, AAV through the nose and utilize the nose brain pathway to, to get the AAV directly into the brain. But if we just do intranasal delivery itself, delivery efficiency will, will be low. So what we did is we utilize this non-invasive route combined with folk ultrasound with microbubble to enhance the local accumulation at a specific brain region. So, so I, I do believe there, there, there is also a, a possibility of alternative routes that, that is less explored. Yeah, very exciting work. Thanks, thanks for adding that, Hong. Um, maybe I'll just turn it to Natasha, you first, and then Isabel, if you could just share with the audience you know, where has the use of fo focus ultrasound been applied um, and researched to date for different indications using cell and gene therapies and kind of where do you see that evolving? Sure, so maybe I can paint a broad picture and then uh, turn it over to Isabel for a more okay. specific CNS-oriented <laughs> overview. Um, so, you know, I think chiefly what we're going to talk about today and what's probably reflected in the literature is that with respect to CNS diseases, whether it's brain tumors or neurodegenerative disease, blood-brain barrier opening has been under a great deal of exploration yeah. for potentiating gene therapy approaches. And, and these really span the spectrum as to what types of gene products, viral versus non-viral vectors, even um, cell products, as Russell was mentioning, we've seen work now with CAR T cell delivery and K cell delivery. Uh, but that said, you know, there are also um, a lot of other applications in the periphery that are more broadly leveraging the combination of ultrasound and microbubbles to basically cause mechanical perturbation to tissues and sort of lift some of those physical barriers that would then enable um, not only delivery of gene products, but in principle, higher um, transfection or transduction. And then there are also, I would say, some other, what I think are very cool emerging applications of FUS that are more centered on modulation of genetic circuits. And I, I sort of say that broadly because yeah. there's some work in the literature that's leveraging um, thermal uh, regimens in order to sort of spatiotemporally modulate um, gene expression within tissues, but then also, as we heard from Hong, there are these really cool approaches now with sauna genetics where yep. we think that we can actually um, modulate um, gene products, for instance, CAR T cells, in order to sort of remotely control the expression of something like a CAR and thereby mitigate, you know, off-tumor, uh, on, off tumor on target toxicities. Uh, with those types of products. And I think that's also a really promising pathway as we think about um, focused ultrasound beyond just the goal of enabling greater delivery. So I will pause there and turn it over to Isabel to talk about her work and... Yes, please, yeah. Isabel. Thanks so much, uh, Nick, Hon, and Natasha for starting the discussion. So to follow up a little bit, in terms of indication, what, what's been happening is for gene therapy, it's been used with intracranial injection, as um, as Nick mentioned, so very localized invasive surgeries. And for example, in Alzheimer's disease, it's been done with uh, nerve growth factor to stimulate cell survival. And with focus ultrasound, we have a lot of blood brain barrier opening that has been done in several conditions, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson, ALS, and many other, just to talk about disorder of the brain and in cancer, obviously, uh, which was the first. So. In terms of moving forward, I think you know combining what we know about gene therapy that has been done with intracranial injection and how did it work and what were the challenges and how are we going to make this better with focus ultrasound and the new technology for gene delivery. So in terms of 
vectors. I mean, the one I'm uh, more that we're working on for yeah, about 15 years now are the AAVs. And the reason we started with that is based on what Nick had said as well, that uh, it's been used in the clinic and for uh, spinal muscular atrophy has been very successful in chil children. And we know AV9, for example, is safe when it's injected intravenously. It can penetrate into the spinal cord, mainly for spinal muscular atrophy. And in neonates or in infants, the blood spinal cord barrier is much more permeable. Same thing as a blood brain barrier, it's much more permeable at early ages. So that was you know, a great candidate. So that's why we started a lot of our work with AEV9 and to just give a broad view of what has been done with the AEVs without going in details, but feel free to ask more questions if you want, is that the um, you have to think of AEVs as three components for gene therapy, you have the capsid or the serotype, which would bind to cells that you want to transduce or to pass the blood brain barrier, for example, and you have the promoter, and then you have the transgene, what you want to express, and that can impact at several different levels. So in terms of potentializing what we can do with focus ultrasound is really to look at these three components for the AEV, and I'm not even going into other gene carriers, and really find what are the best combination that can be done with focus ultrasound. So we know what we could, that some of the AV serotypes, the capsid will be better, for example, for neurons, other will be better for astrocytes, and there's challenges with astrocytes and the immune response that we can discuss as well. Um, so the possibility are somewhat endless and the technology keeps moving and, and I'm the eternal optimist. So I think the unmet need of delivery to the brain non-invasively can be achieved with focus ultrasound and we just have to find the right, the right carrier to, uh, to, you know, to be put in the bloodstream or in other avenue. I agree with intranasal, intratecal, intra in the cisterna magna, like we could try them all and, and see um, what would happen. Um, one last point before we move on is the also um, from the work of Richard Price that I wanted to highlight where he, he also did the sonoselective delivery with focus ultrasound, which I thought was really interesting, which is without the blood brain barrier modulation. And then, you know, we could selectively target endothelial cells for a particular disease and use the blood vessel to then deliver the therapeutic into that part of the brain. So I think that's really cool too. I'll stop there. I could keep going, but I'll stop. Please, um. <laughs> Isabel, I have a question for you. I'm wondering, uh, can you talk more about your recent work on the AV2 HBKO? So you, you did a wonderful, beautiful paper compare this uh, uh, AV2 with the AV9. Probably you can tell us more about it. Definitely. So I'm really happy. Thank you for the question, Hong. I didn't want to go on. Um, so the HBKO, what, the reason we started that is in collaboration with Sanofi, like a fantastic team that we collaborated with. And, the, and that's also the potential of Focus Ultrasound. What do they have in pharmaceutical company that are really, really good, that they worked on, that they prepared the clinical level of, um, you know, a quality control and all of that, that we can move forward to the clinic, hopefully with ultrasound. So the HBKO, the reason we went with that vector is because when I talked about the capsid, they remove some of the heparin sulfate glycoprotein around the capsid so that it will not bind as tightly to the cells of the brain and then it will have more diffusion. The virus are very good to tightly bind to neurons and astrocytes and then they integrate, but it's also a very small dispersion, so you don't transduce a large area. So that's why we use the HBKO, and as you saw in the paper, when you look at where we did the ultrasound spot, actually compared to the EV9, the EV9 will stay centered to the ultrasound spot, but with the HBKO, it's diffusing much more. So we were really able to target large brain areas with only smaller focused ultrasound uh, spot. And the uh, immune response was very low also with the HBKO because it's a, it has a preference for neurons and that's something very important to consider. As soon as you transduce astrocyte, even more so microglia, but microglia are very hard to transduce, you, any uh, antigen presenter cell, you will start initiating the cascade of the immune response, which could have a serious effect to consider. Thanks, Hong, for the question.
Yeah, thanks, Isabel. Maybe, um, Nick, just turning to you since the topic of adverse events and safety signals with opening of the blood-brain barrier and potential cell and gene therapy approaches, what, what do we know now um, on the safety profile of these approaches? Right. So if we're doing a gene therapy with FUS BBB opening, there's two components. There's the safety of the therapy and then the safety of the BBB opening. And as we've seen throughout this conference, we're getting more and more clinical data that is giving better and better confidence that we can safely open the BBB and patients, uh, you know, primarily cancer patients, but more and more patients with neurodegenerative disorders. And so I think us in this field and hopefully people outside are more and more convinced that there is this safe window where we can achieve BBB opening without doing damage. And then on the agent side, uh, giving them intravenously, uh, of course, it's been shown to be safe, but the big signal is that it's dose dependent. And at these high systemic doses, you can have real toxicity that's a, a, a concern. And this is why Hong's work on intranasal delivery is so great because she's circumventing the yeah. systemic. And if we can find other routes to do that, I'd say the last point that I'd be interested to hear from the other panelists on what they think is. You know, a lot of the safety data in patients essentially is for delivering a chemotherapy, which is a much different agent than an AAV, and is the type of BBB opening we're doing in relatively small volumes and only a few times. Is that enough to translate to a neurodegenerative disorder where the patient has sort of a different risk profile, potentially different treatment? Um, regimen that they would have to undergo. You, you yeah. probably, uh, there's, there's <laughs> one, one talk at this symposium uh, where they delivered AAV to monkeys. Maybe you can comment on that work. That's right. Yeah, so good, good, good point. Just quickly, uh, Dr. Jose Obeso from a uh, group in Spain has a, a great talk. I think it's MOV23, and where they have shown, for the first time that I've seen, um, I don't know, Isabel, if you've seen before, non-human primate data with AAV delivery, so it's, it's definitely worth checking out. Can I ask a question? Is there, um, I guess sort of similar to gene therapy, is, have there been studies on, you know, focused ultrasound and, and, and viral therapy, you know, for example, for brain tumors like, you know, like the ones that, you know, Senator McCain received and, and Bo Biden received, and, Will this platform enable the enhancement of those, um, you know, viral-based anti-cancer therapies and, you know, plus minus R cell therapies and, and it, right, like just because it's sort of similar enough, right, like the, that also limits um, the efficacy. Is there stuff ongoing, you guys, you know, on that front or? I, I, don't, I don't think so, based on, based on my knowledge. Isabel, probably, do you know anyone work on viral therapy combined with folk ultrasound? See, that's an opportunity to explore. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully we don't cross, like, I am legend, because it's that Ru it's the, Russell, yeah. you should start uh, writing that grant application this afternoon. Um, maybe just one, we did get one question from the audience, I actually got it after my talk on Tuesday, which is again related to safety and someone in the audience asked a question, if you loosen a blood-brain barrier in a disease like uh, GBM, do you run the risk that you're going to have met peripheral metastases that leak out of the brain into the periphery and actually make patients' conditions worse? Nick, any, any thoughts on that from your experience to date and what might be available in the literature? I know we're early days in the field, but... Right. It's not something I've heard about, but that's not my full area of expertise. Um, but it's, it's not something I've ever heard of. I don't know if Natasha is... Uh, that, that's actually something uh, we looked, but... but but we're not expert in that. I just say, so, so we have been trying to open the blood brain barrier uh, instead of deliver drugs into the brain. We try to get brain tumor specific DNA RNA protein released from brain to the blood. And the first question we always get is, yes. uh, 
Yeah. yeah, whether there's concern of metastasis. So we did try to collect the blood and look look for whether we get tumor cells there, whether we get anything that, that it was, but so far I think uh, it's hard to say a definitely no, um, but because it's hard to, hard to show it's true, uh, non, uh, truly no, but, but so far based on what we have, uh, what, what we have done, we didn't see any tumor cells get released, which also makes sense because when we try to open the blood-brain barrier, the pressure that we use is very low mm -hmm. with a goal that we only get therapeutic agents delivered or, or DNA-RNA released, the, uh, the, the door is not open wide enough to get cells across, but still, I think the question is uh, remain open. Natasha, Isabel, any, any thoughts on that same point? Yeah, I would just add to that to say this is a question that we get very often, and yeah. I think we could do with like a systematic uh, answer within the field, especially because, you know, my group works not only in the brain tumor space, but in the extracranial tumor space as well, where we're performing both mechanical and thermal regimens. So especially with tumor types that do have a proclivity for metastasis from, you know, distal regions into the brain, I think this becomes an even more salient question. Um, so just to kind of build off of what Hong said, all I can say for now is that we too are looking. <laughs> yeah. We don't have a definitive answer yet, but also, you know, I would say the wealth of preclinical data and for that matter, clinical data that are available thus far would not suggest um, that we are um, liberating CTCs to the point of like potentiating metastasis with focused ultrasound and everything is pointing to safety. Um, uh, at this time. So, you know, the, at least empirically what we've learned about FUS um, speaks against that. And I think, you know, from a general perspective, if you think about the types of diseases that we're, we're pursuing with this line of research and the applications of both genetic medicine approaches with improved delivery, the preponderance of benefit versus risk is in the favor of, of, of benefit. So I think, that question actually came from a patient advocacy representative, and I just thought it would be, you know, in fair balance, like raise it here so that we can have a transparent conversation about when we think about starting these research projects and application of patient population and in a clinical trial that we're really mindful about this benefit risk uh, trade off and also on how we interact with regulatory agencies to mitigate any risks that do evolve. So. I just wanted to just kind of punctuate that point. Um, uh, yes, please. You mentioned about the patient. Uh, I also have a question for you. So, so for the rare disease, I'm just curious for rare diseases that affect the brain. Um, so because focus ultrasound technology is a targeted therapy, we, we can target a specific location in the brain. I'm just wondering for those rare diseases, the, the disease probably spread in, in a whole brain. Do you, do you think um, this target localized therapy can truly help patient? I, I think you must have been listening to some of the conversations that Frederick and I had throughout the day, which is, um, you know, we kind of look at the spectrum of biodistribution depending upon, particularly in the CNS and also to a certain extent also in the peripheral nervous system and the enteric nervous system is the degree of biodistribution you want across the CNS is highly dependent upon the etiology of the disease and whether or not it's within a particular substructure of the brain, for example, in Parkinson's or some of the more common pediatric uh, metabolic diseases that have a neurologic component where every neuron and potentially every cell in the CNS has the same metabolic defect. You want a very broad distribution for much more targeted indications where there's a unique cell type in a particular substructure, you may want something very focused. And it's kind of that continuum of broad distribution versus focus where understanding disease biology uh, is really important. And unfortunately, sometimes our knowledge about the disease biology is not very good. And the preclinical models that we use also have their own inherent limitations. and. Um, and limitations, and so this is an area where I think collectively the confluence of disease biology plus genetic medicine approaches plus improved delivery, potentially with focused ultrasound, is kind of like, and I think about it, a Venn diagram, that combination is like at the very heart. So, you know, it's an excellent question. We think about it all the time. Um, Russell, maybe just one question for you regarding cell therapies. Yeah. Um, 
as you think about the application of your research into different enhancements of delivery for cell therapies, are there certain areas that you are looking at as more promising or, or areas where you think there's kind of low-hanging fruit that the field could very readily track towards some therapeutic interventions that will work today versus, say, five years from now? Yeah. So one thing, you know, obviously besides the opening of the blood-brain barrier, one thing I was thinking of is actually just, you know, it's for lack of a better, you know, like shining the, the focused ultrasound on, on the tumor site and changing it enough so that it becomes an attractive destination for the cells. You know, like making, you know, like the vasculature more inflamed and more permeable and, you know, like the cells get attracted by increased release of chemokines. And then by doing this too, you activate the heat shock response of the tumor, hopefully keep it less, you know, escapee, you know, from mm -hmm. our cells enough, right? Like you would obviously still rely on the cells with their natural migration there, but that'll be a significant help, you know? And, and I think like what Natasha was saying, just disrupting whatever physical obstacles are there, right? So the clinical trial literally is just adding this very non-invasive, you know, procedure yep. um, on top of an existing, you know, CAR-T trial or cell therapy trial. I mean, I don't know if the FDA, but that seems to me like, a, you know, like a lower hanging fruit in terms of, you know, uh, combining the two. I guess the other things is speaking to some of the remote control ones, right? Like it, it, it one thing, in speaking about the, um, the off, um, the, the off, right, like the, um, you know, where, where, where you don't want it to act, right? So you could do the opposite too, right? Like I know, you, uh, I don't know if you, it's your paper that did the remote control when, where the car uh, got expressed, so, right? Yeah, I can, I'll just give a shout out to Dr. Wang, Peter Wang at UCSD, he's really done some of the pioneering work on, on sonogenetically yeah. driven CAR T's. And he was in the cancer immunotherapy panel yesterday, but okay. certainly what you're alluding to, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so one thing that we could do as well is, is almost the opposite of that, right? Like, so couple, I don't know, caspase nine, caspase eight to it. So then it's the sonogenetic therapy is the kill switch. Right, so, so then if you have, I don't know, liver, GVHD, then you, you know, remote control it off. Mm -hmm. You have, you know, skin, whatever here, then you remote control it off. But then it'll only be at that region. And then you also preserve the circulating cells that you sort of hope that will, you know, lead to memory and, you know, lymph node, you know, like, uh, it, you know, integration into our memory um, responses. So I think that's... That's potentially, you know, a more preclinical side, but you know, something that um, that can help integrate um, the two as well. And then last, because we're a manufacturing lab too, it does have applications, I think, in the manufacturing process too, right? Like it could help activate some of these, you know, dendritic cells, immune cells, you know, its interactions with capsaicin receptors, for example, that might help the manufacturing, and that and. You know, it's not an application per se on the actual, you know, clinic and on the actual patient, but it is another low-lying food because it is on the manufacturing yeah. side. So you integrate it during the manufacturing process. You, you know, again, like you shine, you, you, you make the focused ultrasound um, intervention and you enhance production. Then you have exactly the same cell product, you know, more enhanced, and, and you, but you incorporate focused ultrasound. In so that's something that could be, yeah, I think those might be the low-lying fruit. Great. Thanks, Russell. We only have a few minutes left. So I'm just curious. I didn't get any questions on the iPad. Does anyone in the audience have a question that they would like to ask? I see one brave person here. <laughs> so um, I think during this whole symposium, we've had a lot of discussion about um, the wide range of dosing and parameters that are used in focus ultrasound. And when we look at gene therapies, right now there's been a lot of studies across different nanoparticle formulations or vector types. And I'm wondering if we at these early stages should be starting to look at standardizing or coming to a narrower array of carrier types, or should we start talking about that if we want these clinical tra translations going forward? All right, who would want to take that one? Natasha, you want to tackle that one? And anyone else on the panel, please feel free to add your thoughts. Yeah, 
I mean, you know, I think this has been a resonant theme when you look across all the panel discussions that have happened throughout this meeting. And so I think we really now have to take it upon ourselves as a field to decide how we're going to address this challenge uh, together, because I also don't think we can really do that in our own silos. Um, so, you know, this was certainly something that came up during the cancer immunotherapy panel and now during this panel. And what's, what it's left me thinking about is, you know, first of all, how we can sort of organize around, you know, creating more documentation or more dialogues for the systematization of some of this stuff across groups. Um, but also, you know, I think that we really have to lean on the pre-existing knowledge within other fields to understand what the ripest opportunities are for leveraging focused ultrasound. So we've talked about goals like in the cell therapy space using immune modulation to activate the vasculature or reducing dose of gene products or cell products, lifting physical barriers of various sorts, and to, to really demonstrate robustly that focused ultrasound can achieve these goals can then help us understand where we can sort of plug that into the constellation of you know, different indications and products that might be available. Um, so I think, and I wonder how you know, my sort of like AAV colleagues think about this, but I feel like from a CAR T cell perspective, I've been thinking a lot about where the biggest bottlenecks are uh, in the field, and I know one of those is certainly with you know, being able to reduce dose and thereby reducing cost potentially of these products. So, um, you know, whether we go to what works relatively well but could be better, or whether we sort of look to the things that just really aren't working well is also probably something that's up for discussion, too. Uh, I can see from the AV perspective, um, Isabel mentioned this as well at the start, that it sounds like she made the decision to go with AVs because they have the most clinical evidence and seem like the shortest path to clinical translation, and we made that decision, too. Um, they in some ways take away the biggest advantage of focus ultrasound, it's repeatability, because you, you can only give AAVs once because they initiate yeah. an immune response, and so we can't use then BBB opening to either paint out large regions of the brain over multiple treatments or attack the same region to build up concentration. So I think AAVs, I mean, who knows, but might be a great way to get our foot in the door and sort of show a first proof of principle then to really have an effect, develop these other carriers that can really utilize the repeatability of BBB opening, which is a, you know, a big advantage of our field over these other invasive routes. Great, thank you, Natasha, Nick. Isabel, I would, I would ask you for your thoughts, but we're already over time. Okay, and, uh, I, will, uh, I agree with everything they said. I was going to combine them with a little bit add on because I think it, all I want to see is like in terms of reaching therapeutic efficacy, I think that's what we have to go for instead of using our, our GFP or our other markers. So that's the next step. Well, thank you. And I, I guess, Neil, a request from our gene therapy panelists is we should do a workshop on focus ultrasound and gene therapy in the near future because I had the feeling we could have talked for another six hours here if we were left to our own devices. But Isabel, thank you for joining us remotely from Toronto. And Russell, Natasha, Hung, and, and uh, Nick, thank you uh, for all your excellent insights and perspectives. Please, audience, give them a nice round of applause.